Won't that be great, being around the throne of God, singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Don't have to worry about anything else. Don't have to worry about the baseball game being rained out. Don't have to worry about all those things that, that burden my heart and, and stuff like that. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We're in our overcoming series, and we want to talk about um, the next two weeks, overcoming our past. When I looked at the series and I was in charting it out, because we all have stuff to overcome. And when you talk about overcoming your past, you just open up an arena, a, a broad, broad subject material, which you could go, you know, for week in and week out, depending on how detailed you want to get. So I'm just going to speak a little bit more in generalities this morning and next week on this subject and give you some basic principles of understanding how to approach um, your past. Because you, if you haven't figured that out already, are a unique individual. You might not have known that till you married another person or something like that, but you are a unique individual. You married a unique individual. You birthed unique individuals. There is no two people's DNA are exactly alike, um, and we're all different. We all have different temperaments. We have different personalities. We have different strengths, and we have different weaknesses. Then you throw in life. You throw in our parents or lack of parents. You throw in their mistakes that they made. You throw in a personal temperament or events in your life, events in your past that maybe helped mold you or, or um, correct you in some way. You throw in losses. <clears throat> you throw in physical pain, which for some would be very real, for others it wouldn't be very real. You throw in social environments. I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood. I live in a middle-class neighborhood. Didn't have a lot of violence in my neighborhood and didn't see people dying in the streets. You throw that into the equation, growing up in that environment. Then you throw in a few bad decisions here or there. Not that any of us have ever made them. And then you throw all those ingredients into a blender and you blend it up and you pour the drink and, and that's you, a self smoothie. <laughs> that's just how that makes us up who we are. I'm a different person than you, and you're a different person than me. And that's what the beautiful, beautiful thing about the grace of God is. You can't judge people because they're just different. I may not understand your weakness, and you may not understand mine. And I have this conversation with my wife all the time. He goes, I don't know why that bothers you, because that doesn't bother me. Um, and, 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 but on the other flip coin, she can say the same thing to me. I don't know why that bothers you. That doesn't bother me, because we're all wired differently. That's why. So it allows me to do with my spouse is to simply love her unconditionally, and she, and she me, because we understand we're just different. And the uniqueness starts at our birth and goes through out our life. Now, you know, and I've chronicled this very clearly, you know, um, you know you're a mess. Okay, we, 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 we know that. Um, we don't do no convincing there. And uh, maybe up here, maybe in here, uh, maybe out here in, in physical manifestations, we all have things. And Jesus knew we were a mess, and God knew we were a mess. He knew we were a mess as soon as the apple was eaten in the Garden of Eden. He goes, now a mess has been created. <laughs> it's called the fall of man, the depravity of man. And, um, and so God looked at the mess, and he said, how are we going to fix this? Because they can't fix it themselves. They don't have the ability to fix it themselves. So God's wisdom... And I love this, God's love and God's power came up with a master plan of how to fix the human mess. And we know that to be that cross right back there. That's God's wisdom, that's God's power, and that's God's plan to fix you and I, this side of heaven. Easy plan, next side of heaven, that's just automatic. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. The fixing's done at that point. But this side of heaven, so we can have a life, eternal life, which is what it is, that starts right now and experience it right now. So 
With that said, let's look at this a little bit. This is, if I was going to throw a, a Bible term on here, it would be the term regeneration. I just want to show you sort of how this happens. John 3.3, 3. you know the, the account, some of you, I hope you do. Um, Nicodemus, a student of the word of God, um, a Pharisee and respected within Jerusalem, the academic community within Jerusalem. He comes to Jesus secretly, sort of behind the scenes, didn't want to be really seen with him or identified with him yet. But there was something different about this Jesus that intrigued him. So he came to him and said, um, basically, what must I do um, to be born to um, have, gain eternal life? And picked up the story in John 3, 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He wasn't getting this. <laughs> there was something right over what Nicodemus said there, because right now their religion was outward and law-based. They didn't realize there was something deeper than that. And what Jesus is saying, no, there's a, a new rebirth that is available because of me and because of the cross. There's a rebirth that's available to every human being. When I resurrect, it's gonna, every human being is going to have the opportunity to be rebirthed on the inside and become a different person, and then that mess that Adam and Eve created can start being redeemed and bought back and healed and transformed. We call this the exchange life spiritual transformation. Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water, physical birth, and of the spirit, a second birth, happens at a point in time, doesn't happen by going to church, being religious or being good. It happens simply by making a decision at a point in time in a human life where you say yes to Jesus Christ. And at that point, that rebirth takes place. It's an event. Sometimes you talk to folks, you ask them about their Christian faith. Well, I grew up a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. I go to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. I give money. Okay, that might make you a Christian. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And, um, and, and, um, and so... That, and it's, no, it's a, it's a second birth. It's an event that takes place in one's life. You may, have a more, you may be a moral person, an ethical person, a good person. You may not have a litany of bad things that you've done in your life. You may have never hurt anyone, stolen from anyone, or wounded anyone. But unless you can point back to a point in time where you said somehow in the heart language of your heart between you and God that, yes, I understand I need a Savior, and I'm asking Jesus to be my savior. I had an official time I did that in my life in 1977 at 19 years old, but I really look back and evaluate. It happened about nine months before that, playing high school football with a guy in a football camera. That's when I truly gave my heart to Christ. I didn't see any life change right away, but I meant business, and I gave my heart to Christ in 19, August of 1976. So I'm actually older than I look. <laughs> And um, so he said, and that which is born of the flesh, that is flesh. And then Jesus said, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's saying every human being has the potential to have what happened to them from their past, the fallen life redeemed. Every human being doesn't have to be their past. And whatever that means, every human being is not bound by their temperament, by their bad par um, parenting that they might have been um, exposed to. It's not bound by their culture or their society. Every human being that's born again has the ability of true life change. Now, it'd be great if you just flipped a switch. It doesn't work like that. This life change goes on until I change destinations. That means until I die. <laughs> Then it ends. Then I'm changed for good. Then I'm totally transformed into the image of Christ at that point. And this is going on with me, and I'm still processing things. My things I'm processing are a lot more subtle now than they used to be. And this will go on the rest of our lives. 
We see Paul's um, epic, if you read Romans chapter 7, I'm not going to read it for you, but it, Paul's, I call it an epic rant <laughs> of how he, wicked he was, and, um, and how the things that I want to do, I don't do them. The things I'm supposed to be doing, I don't do those. Um, the things I don't want to, I'm just, I'm a mess. I'm supposed to go this way, I go that way. I'm supposed to think like this, I think like that. Then in Romans um, 7.25, in the original language, in the Greek, it's very, very strong. He says, oh, what a wretched man am I. Who is going to deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to deliver me, if I can, if I can tailor fit my message here, who's going to deliver me from the effects of my past? That flesh in me, that need base, that reaction that condemnation, that guilt, that legal understanding of, of, of God. Who's going to deliver me from that? I'm a mess. Very strong language. And then Romans, um, then it's, it's actually 24 and 25. He says, therefore now I serve, with my mind I serve the law of God. Then we kick into Romans 8.1, which really when the Bible was written, there was no chapters there. Remember this. This is a continuation of Romans chapter 7. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So therefore, in light of all those things, and then in the 25, it says, therefore, with my mind, I will now serve the law of God. In light of all that, my depravity, my inner struggle, my past, how it impacts my present, there is no condemnation. No more judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. And those are some of the most powerful words in the New Testament. In Christ Jesus. We'll be talking about that in the next few weeks. Then he says this. And this verse is sometimes um, separated from verse 1 and you can't. They're a continuation of the thought. For the law of the spirit of life. And if you've, I've taught you many times. The governing principle. Law here can be translated governing principle. The governing principle, oftentimes it's nomos, it just talks about the Mosaic law, but oftentimes in the Pauline epistles, especially in Romans, it can be translated as a governing principle. For the governing principle of the spirit, the thing that governs my life, the governing principle of the spirit has set me free in Christ Jesus, those wonderful words again, from the law, the governing principle of sin and death. Now, I'll take sin and death and say the past, the governing principle of my past, the things from yesterday of my life, from my childhood to maybe yesterday, that reaches its hands into my present and wants to impact me somehow, wants to impact the things I do, wants to impact me more importantly how I think. I want to set you free from the governing principles of your past. Now, how do we do that? We were born again. So that means starting going forward, we're gonna give you some practical ways to think here in a moment, but going forward, I start with the premise, I can be okay. I can overcome. I'm not always gonna be bound by this. I'm not always gonna be addicted maybe to this. I, I can overcome I won't always be insecure. I don't have to be. I won't always be fearful. Rejection won't always bother me. I won't always be clamoring for the need of affirmation and acceptance and approval from man. I'm going to get victory over that. It's a process, but Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. He set me free. He's given me this life in me that is the boss of the life that I knew before Christ. My new life supersedes the authority of my old life, according to these verses. So first point I want to bring up, the past isn't really about the past. It's a little tricky, play on words. When you, when you look at it with sort of clarity here and you, and you, you do a little mind bender around it, there is actual no thing, nothing called the past, 
All I have is the present. I may have memories of something that happened before, but those things aren't in front of me right now. I drove to Starbucks this morning. I can't, I'm not there right now. I did a mobile order that crashed and burned, and then I lost my free reward. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for a little sympathy here. I'd gathered 124 stars. I had a free coffee coming, and I lost it, and I complained to them, and they didn't care. (laughs) Wounded me, brought me back to my childhood. (laughs) Everything that happens, happens in the present. It can't be any other way. Memories or events are thoughts occurring in the present. And we all have them, don't we? I have some pretty big ones that I have to battle all the time for my own losses and trauma in my life. Anger or hurt about the past is happening now. In other words, your present moment experience is in the now. It's what keeps my past alive. Now, I'm not saying you're going to hear this message and be done with battling with your past. All I'm saying is the past always has this hand reaching into our present. It's what I do with that hand that dictates how much impact that past is going to have over me. Now, I may have to pry one finger at a time, and that may take me 10 years to do that. But it can be done. Jesus Christ can heal me and deliver me. So, if I want to heal from the past, I put my attention on the present moment experience. Now, I've known this in my own life, and you know my story, and the loss of our daughter and how we lost her was very traumatic, and, and, um, and that is a consistent hand that is coming into my present. It never goes away. It's just there all the time. And, um, and I, if, I, if I let myself connect to that, I know it's there, but it's like a chain pulls me back into a room, a dark room where there is no hope and just despair. So I, I, I really practice my thinking and don't let that happen. Not that I ever want to forget. There's a balance, it's a tricky thing with a grieving parent. But it can be crippling if I didn't have the power of the God that allows me to um, start prying those fingers off my present. Let's look at these verses. Philippians chapter 3. Now, dear bro- no, dear brothers, I have not achieved this. He's talking about spiritual, full spiritual transformation here, if you read verses 11 and 12. But I focus on this one thing. I haven't attained, he says, I should have included all the verses there, it would have made more sense. I haven't attained, verse 11 and 12, I haven't attained perfection, I haven't attained total freedom yet, I haven't attained free deliver, all deliverance yet, I haven't done that, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, and I look forward to what lies ahead. I press, verse 14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive a heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, is calling us. And what he's talking about there is an eternal perspective, and that's something we'll probably get into next week. He elevated his vision beyond what happened, where he's come from, his training, which he, he, he brings out in his books, in his epistles. And the honor that his training would give him, he goes, I, I forget those things, I'm leaving those things behind, they're but dung, and I'm elevating my perspective into eternal perspective. Now, forgetting is, this is, um, um, who is this? This is Kenneth Wiest. Um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure, yeah, this is Kenneth Wiest. Forgetting is stronger in the Greek. It means completely forgetting. Paul uses an illustration of a Greek runner completely forgetting his opponents whom he is leading in the race just as the runner's speed is slackened should he think of those behind him and the thud, thud of their pounding feet. So the Christian's onward progress is hindered should he dwell on the past full of failures and sins. 
and full of heartaches and discouragements, full of disappointments and thwarted hopes and plans. As long as the Christian has made things right with God and man, he should completely forget his past. And I might soften that last sentence a little bit because to me it puts a little guilt on you if you don't because we're just human and you can't really forget it. You can just control it. Big difference, forgetting it and controlling it. Understanding the nature of our woundedness cannot be denied or ignored, but it's where we park our thought process. Where am I going to dwell on my thinking? Number two, memories are not the problem. A memory is a thought, and a thought has no power or meaning whatsoever unless we give it power or meaning. Now, sometimes those thoughts, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week, are are connected to something in the past that are very strong and very traumatic. And that line that draws the two together is something that needs to be understood. And we have to receive grace. You know, I'm gonna, we're going to leave, we're going to hear about this message, and some of us will leave and like, I'm never going to think wrong again until sometimes this afternoon, and you find yourself thinking wrong again. And that's why you got to give yourself grace. That's why grace is a wonderful word. It means that I can accept the fact I am a human, and I am going to be um, plagued, and I am going to be hindered sometimes. I am going to be sad sometimes. I am going to be discouraged sometimes. I am going to be all these things, depending on who I am and what I'm dealing with. So after this series, you probably will not skip out of here or skip back in here next week and go into praise the Lord motion. Praise the Lord. I just got a flat tire. <laughs> praise the Lord. God's doing a deep thing in my life. No, that probably won't happen. And um, it's okay to be human. It really is. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to um, struggle. It's okay to battle with discouragement and these things because it just makes us human. What we're trying to do is give you parameters and the hope that these things don't always have to be reaching into our presence and keep us where we're at today 10 years from now. If you see no change in your spiritual growth over a decade, then I would want to evaluate. (laughs) Because it needs to be like anything else, growth. If my daughter was still the size she was when she was six, I'd be concerned. Now she's so big, I'm still concerned. (laughs) See, we grow. Some have thoughts about things that happened long ago. Um, And they made me cause no problem, but some thoughts are sticky. I stole that term from somebody else. They're sticky thoughts. And we have an emotional reaction to them. You think them over and over. You may even have beliefs related to them. In other words, I'm justified for thinking this. Or how about this one? We're going to talk about forgiveness next week. I need an apology so I can move on. Somebody wounded you, and that's reaching into your present causing you distrust, maybe a rejection complex. I need to, I need an apology before I can move on. No, you don't. So this keeps it very much alive and it it means it, it keeps us in a place where it sort of delays our freedom. We lose the sticky thoughts. And again, I don't want to minimize deep loss or trauma. That just doesn't go away. Those things need to be worked through. You work through these things. Some things can go away. The disappointment with man, rejection, people hurting you, insecurity, fears, apprehend, some of those things can be healed and you can really gain victory over them. But when something devastates you so deeply or something happens to you so traumatic, I was in a counseling session um, not too long ago with with a dear woman that, yeah, talked about something that happened when she was five years old. She's my age. She's like 35 now. <laughs> <laughs> or something around that area or something like that. And, and, um, and she, 
And, she, and it wasn't really traumatic in a sense, like it did her no physical harm, it did her no um, nothing like that. It was just some, a, a something in, caught, at five years old, she was rejected by a loved one. And the loved one didn't even know what they were doing, really. It was just a moment in time. But here we are talking, um, you know, um, five decades later, and she never forgot it. I can forget what I'm getting at the grocery store, why I drove there, but I, I, don't, I didn't, didn't forget when my parent rejected me in just one moment when I was five. Interesting. It's those fingers reaching into the present. This is why we believe in the exchange of life, and we'll see that in a moment. Healing, number three, means letting go so the thoughts and the feelings don't impact you. Our goal is to neutralize the story so the past loses its power. Let's use that example of that little girl being rejected at five years old. And that image or that thought or that impulse comes in and makes its way into a common relationship maybe in their life right now. Something somebody says to them triggers it or something like that. I can live there. I can park there. I can think, oh no, this is going to happen again. Oh no, I felt this pain before. Or I can take what I know to be true through the word of God and say that was what I used to be. I, man did reject me but the God of the universe accepts me just the way that I am. And I'm going to get to that in a moment, and I'm going to show you how that sort of works. You change your relationship. This is a good statement. Because I know because I didn't say it. I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> you change your relationship to your thoughts. In other words, I'm thinking this way. I'm not going to accept that. Cop launch. I'm changing my relationship to my, I, this is how I want to think. I want to think with healthy. I want to be think healthily. I want to think purely. I want to think how God thinks. So I'm not just accepting what happened in my past as my normal. I'm going to now start filtering what I may know, know experientially so what I know is true scripturally. If my goal is to make myself forget about the past, um, that's impossible. You can't forget it. You manage it. Or you don't let it manage you. Stuff or ignore your feelings just creates other problems, addictions. That's where addictions come from, I should say. My approach early on in pastoral ministry, because I was so busy and I had this very naive approach to dealing with internal struggles because I didn't have a lot of internal struggles. I always had a laid back temperament and I couldn't understand why people um, battled with certain things. I never felt like I had a rejection complex or anything like that. My parents weren't bad parents. They weren't great parents. I, I, um, but it was, it was, I never felt some, some of the things other people had. I just assumed people liked me unless they told me otherwise. And most of the times they don't tell you. They'll just ignore you. They don't tell you. So I can live in that blessed ignorance all the time. And, and it's, so it's a gift, blessed ignorance. I, 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 I say this jokingly, but I, and I really have trained myself through the years to think like this. Unless you tell me to get out of your life, I'm considering myself invited. <laughs> you have to be really blunt with me or I won't believe because I'm not going to believe what my thoughts tell me. So I'm getting at it. I don't want to let how I think, I don't want that to control me. No, you like me. I mean, you like me a lot. <laughs> no, and, um, and I believe that with all my heart. And I like you a lot too. Now, you can whisper to me on the way out the door, I like you, but really not that much. And I'll, re, and I'll reconfirm my thinking a different way concerning you. But in the meantime, you've got to tell me. I'm just taking it on, I'm upping the level here. And I'm going to take it just as it is. No, you like me a lot. <laughs> Unless you tell me otherwise. If you tell me otherwise, I'll preach about you. <laughs> Just kidding. You wait for an apology or acknowledgement that postpones happiness. You wait for time to heal all wounds. 
you're going to run out of time. <laughs> you wallow endlessly in your emotions. It never causes any growth. Or you try to redo the past. You can't change what happened, but you can absolutely change how we react to it. And you keep holding as possible freedom, peace, sanity, liberty in the moment. We become fully alive in the present. Now, there's something here. This is where my counseling stuff comes up. But this is really, I, I, I take the secular, I, I was trained in Christian counseling, but I, they, the studies show um, that the, the number one counseling technique with the best results, and many techniques out there that are very good, is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, anyone um, CBT? Well, you put another C in front of it, it's Christian cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, um, I, I probably not very cognitive. I have behavior problems. I need therapy. But it was um, but but Christian cognitive behavioral therapy. Basically, that the, the philosophy says that the human difficulties stem from thinking. Amen. So just Google that. We're good. <laughs> it comes from it comes from thinking. It's not the event, but a person's belief about the event that causes emotional disturbance. And this is where this, this therapy, and it's a very simple thing, and it's sort of, uh, I'm going to take it into a Christian realm. Um, a lot of Christians, I, they have issues with I have no issues with it at all. It's this, I, I, I take truth. See, and with cognitive, secular cognitive behavioral therapy, they don't have a truth called the Bible. But as a Christian, I have truth called the Bible. And the Bible tells me who God is, and the Bible tells me what he did for me on the cross, and he tells me who I am in him. So I take these thoughts that invade my, from my past, that invade my present, and I say, okay, that, those thoughts lie against the truth that I know what the Bible says about me. I'm charging you all 60 bucks an hour for this. <laughs> and, um, and so I, and I begin changing how I think about, now that's a process. When I, when, I, when I did the P90X workout program, the first time I tried to do a pull-up, I just hung. This was my pull-up. That was it. I moved an inch. And um, I'm saying, this ain't going to work. But three months later, I've been working on these pull-ups. I did 39. That was my record, 39. And I haven't tried it since. But it was, but it was, but that was, I, but it, I couldn't do 39, 90 days before. It took me 90 days to train myself to work up to that. I'm not going to just enter into this, this um, biblical, topical concordance mode. I have to practice it. We call it the exchange life. And the goal of this type of therapy is to challenge irrational thoughts. Now, what would I call an irrational thought as a Christian? Anything that contradicts the word of God. If it contradicts who God is and his character and nature and makes God an angry God, condemning God, a judgmental God, I know I contradict that with truth. If it makes the ministry of the cross ineffective in my life, no, I contradict that with truth. If all of a sudden an accusation from the, from the devil or an accusation from my past or something wants to reach an experience into my present, I contradict that with the truth of the word of God. Now you think, that doesn't work. It does work. It does. And just like this therapy works in the, um, the secular realm where they'll tell you to think about this instead or think about that instead, I'm just telling you, think with truth. John eight thirty two because we know the truth can set us free. We call this the exchange life or spiritual transformation. I'm going to do, actually do a whole series on this after this series, probably spend 10 weeks on it, or probably not that many, but a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to close in a moment, but here's just our thoughts. 
I am not my sin. Think like that. And if you're struggling with something, that's not how God sees you. Oh, that's Tim Kelly who does this, this, and this. No, that's Tim Kelly, my, my child. And I love him just the way he is. I died on his cross for that thing he struggles with so he can be free from it. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my life as it was in my past and I'm exchanging it for my new life. Hence the, new, the exchange life that Christ has given us. That's the promise of Romans 8, 2. That's the promise of being born again, that there's a new life in me that supersedes and can control the old life that's also in me. I am not my past. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Thank you. Felt like I was counseling myself. God does love me despite what happened to me. God is for me and God is good even if I have no evidence to support that right now. Because truth is truth with or without evidence. I can't look at facts within time and have the facts within time rewrite truth that are eternal. Because it could be some facts that lie against truth. So God is good even though sometimes really bad things have happened to me. Or God is good despite the fact that maybe I always seem to be coming up on the short end of the stick. I had this conversation with a man that was older than me the other day, and he was just like, I've never been able to, I've never been recognized. I've always, I always sort of come up on the short end of the stick. No one's ever really used my gifts. And he was older than me. He was 36. <laughs> or, or around there. I just always lose track of the dates. But. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, boy, you don't get your identity from that. You don't get your acceptance from that. You don't get your approval from that. I don't look for acceptance from man. I look just to accept man. I don't look for approval from man. I just want to approve man. I don't want to look for success. I just want God to um, anoint whatever he puts my hand to. I'm not looking to get anything from the horizontal. I'm just going to look to the vertical and find my need base met there. And that means I'm going to take what I get vertically and give it out horizontally. Now I'm beginning to sense freedom and liberty. Because what's vertical, what's horizontal in my life, my past, my present, the people, the experiences, the events, has lost its grip. And I'm living this life under God and I'm enjoying what the word of God says about me. And when that little fingers of my past creep into my present, I do the best I can to say, no. I woke up, um, um, I've, this is in the last few weeks, and this is a very common thing for me. I woke up feeling sort of bad. I, I don't know why. My, I've been, my wife's been in South Carolina for just about three weeks apart now. I don't think we've ever been apart this long. I'm married life. She's loving it. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and I remember thinking um, I was guilty about something. I felt like guilty. And I remember thinking, what did I do? Did I watch something bad? No, I watched the Avengers. That would make me guilty. Um, did I do something, say something, think something? That, and I couldn't, I was trying to think, what did I do that I'm convicted of? And I realized I'm not convicted of anything. It's just a lie from the other kingdom. My little religious past saying, you're guilty of something because you always are. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not guilty. I'm a child of God. And God's for me. He loves me just the way he is. He's for me if I read my Bible this morning. He's for me if I don't read my Bible this morning. It's good if I read my Bible. He's for me if I pray. He's for me if I don't pray. It's good that I pray. And I look back over my shoulder. I'm not, I'm not who man says that I am. I'm not defined by culture and, and, so, and society and what they say man is. I'm not defined by my physical appearance. I'm not defined by my bottom line and my investments. None of those things come into the eternal equation of anything. Now, I let 
what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and what he's doing in me. It's not my fault if I was violated when I was young. You're not to blame. I let that go and take on my new identity with Christ. My friend, this is, this, uh, this is the process of beginning to let go of our past. That's taking those fingers that are always reaching into our brain and our thoughts and our emotions and, and just trying to, and it's taking those fingers off one by one, unprying the fingers to eventually six months, one year, two years, five years, ten years, whatever it is, different for all of us, all things, those fingers are no longer in my present. And at that point, I have found freedom from my past. Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for the precious people here. Father, we, um, we can't fight our past. We had no way to redeem ourselves. We needed a redeemer. We needed somebody to intervene on our behalf. We needed somebody to stand in the gap. We needed a savior to not only save us for all eternity, but <clears throat> to save us from ourselves right now, to save us from the world system right now, to save us from our past right now. If you're here this morning and you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we talked about being born again a little earlier. In the quiet place of your heart, if you don't have that day or that time or that moment where you said yes to Jesus Christ, you were born again. It's not about being moral or good or ethical. It's not about what you do, a lifestyle, a practice, anything of those things. It's just simple. It's very, very, very simple. Jesus extends his hand of relationship to the human race. All we do is accept it. Life change will ensue if you let it. But it's not change your life and come to Christ. It's just come to Christ just as you are. If you're here today in your own way, your own words, you said yes to Christ. Let me know after church and let somebody who brought you maybe know after church. We just want to pray with you. Father, I never want to minimize what happens in people's past and make it seem simple. They get victory over it. Because sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's chemical things that happen in our bodies and make it very hard. Sometimes it's deep woundedness that remains unco uncovered for, for decades until something finally exposes it. We're all so different and we all battle so many different things. We never want to minimize it. But we do want to have a hope that it won't always control me. That someday I can dislodge the heavy impact in the dark room of those memories and those thoughts and those practices and live in a freedom that your cross gave me. Bless these words to these precious people and bless the offering we're about to share. We should give it as part of our grace giving. In Jesus' name. Amen.